So good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Let me go ahead and share my screen with uh, where we're going to be. Over here with uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, share. I'm not clicking all the buttons. And hopefully you can see that well. This is part three of our look at the really the, the end of the Reformation. It's really, I think, part six of the Reformation period where um, we've been kind of working. If you remember back to January, if you were with us back in January, we started with the focus on Europe and the, and the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance and the Reformation are both really vital moments in understanding American history. So even if it's not your specialty to be in uh, Europe or aren't sure you have as much background in Europe, I, I find it really important to understand what's happening from the American side of the story when you are able to um, understand kind of the background of the century or so before the colonists started coming over. And as we've journeyed from the, through the Renaissance, we've been in the late 1300s through the 1400s, and one of the things that I told you about the Renaissance is that it is this revolution of revolutions, and one of the most important revolutions that comes out of it is the Reformation. So um, in the Reformation, um, you get this moment where some of the ideas of the Renaissance, of the, the focus of the individual, takes precedent into a spiritual dimension. And so as we look at kind of this movement through, we now come to this end of this, this moment. When you get to the end of the of the Thirty Years' War, there is a sense in which um, the, 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 the Reformation summarizes this idea of the individual um, finding the way for herself to have an interaction spiritually without the need of any sort of a, uh, any sort of a greater um, uh, focus, any sort of a greater sense of, of needing permission, not being able to, to work your way through your views without having to have the control of some larger organization, in this case, the church. And so the, the, the Re Reformation and Renaissance kind of moving itself through this crisis of conflict between individuals and eventually the emergence of the state coincides with this moment. So the Renaissance saying that the individual has the ability to decide for him or herself, and in that idea of the individual being able to think for oneself, then certainly the, by extension, the individual should have the right to be able to participate in the civic structure. You know, what do we do for civic government? And it helped that you know, they'd already gone back and brought back some of the writings of Plato and Aristotle. So even back to the time of Athens, they're able to kind of look and see like, what's this history of, of cities or organizations that allow for the individual to be involved. So as this is happening in this period of the 13, 14, to 1500s, you at the same time have um, kind of the, the flowering and the culmination of the Middle Ages. So if the Middle Ages, and I'm just in my, we're in our fourth week now of our summer classes. So I'm teaching the antiquities class that goes to the Middle Ages, goes to this period, the Thirty Years' War is the last thing that we cover. And one of the things that we look at midway through is the collapse of the Roman Empire. And that's the beginning of the Middle Ages. And so we're kind of talking with the students like, well, what is happening? And why does feudalism emerge? And what's going on there? And one of the things that we can largely say is that this is a moment in which centralization breaks down into decentralization. And so you kind of go backwards to a moment where the nation, and again, they didn't really use that term, but the nation was this small concentrated area, sometimes as small as, as, as a, well, a bishopric, which could sometimes be not more than a few city blocks, and yet it would have an autonomy allowed to itself in, in that setting. So as you go from the 400s to the 1400s, you begin to see power accumulate and it's ebbs and flows for sure, but when we get here to the 15 and 1600s, what is beginning to happen is that there's really locking in this idea of what we will eventually call the nation. So we've been watching that kind of move along the way um, over the time um, as we kind of move our way forward. And so what we've seen over this time is leading into the Renaissance was this kind of dark century of the 1300s loosely, that had a plague, which is something we're all familiar with now, um, had, a, had a world war in the Hundred Years' War, had a threat of, of 
of invasion from outsiders with the coming of the Mongolian peoples um, and had a social, um, religious, internal collapse with the Avignon Papacy, which concludes there in 1418, as you can see, with the Council of Constance. And so out of that comes this kind of growth of larger um, geographic entities, right? So it's not just a city, it's not just a little county. You get larger and larger regions. Two civil wars in England and France, which we talked about, and at the same time on the Iberian Peninsula, a merger kind of developing, which is, a, we know, of course, the creation of the nation we call Spain today. Um, and again, these ideas of there being a thing called France or a thing called England, these are all new. They, they do not, they're not something that would have been known at that time. If we go back in Doc Brown's DeLorean and we landed and we ask in, say, 1450, standing outside of Paris, where am I? Uh, they would not say, you're in France. Um, they, would, they would have said, oh, you're, you're in the Ile de France uh, near Paris. They would have understood the idea of Paris. Meanwhile, the Habsburg family kind of is the legacy of the journey that we've been on um, over the thousand years in which centralized power control was in the hands of a family. And the way I describe it to students, in fact, we did this today in my discussion, is just imagine, you know, the city of Maitland. Um, it's a small city. All of you probably know the city of Maitland. And imagine it being owned by one family. And the city of Winter Park being owned by one family. And Orlando being owned by one family. And all that land that we all live on actually being belonging to a family. And so it's it's this idea of a movement of family control. And in the last uh, three or four episodes, we looked at some of those, kind of what was happening. And the Habsburg family was a family that had emerged in the 12, 1100s on the Rhine River um, between, you know, basically the between of what we eventually call France and Germany. But they had married into, by the 15, 1400s, into the Spanish story. So by moving into the Spanish story, now there was this place where they grew even more powerful. And you may remember the map that we looked at last time, that the Habsburg family was in control of, well, worldwide. I mean, so the old statement of the British Empire, the sun never set on the British Empire, was actually first true about the Habsburgs um, in the 14 and 1500s. And that kind of had come to a pinnacle with Charles. Charles, who becomes the King of Spain, but then eventually, more famously, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and so he controlled all this land. And so while this is happening, there's, he's one of this um, kind of young group of leaders that are coming up representing these families. But then comes the Renaissance. The coming of the Renaissance obviously was, again, as this product of the, of the, um, the I mean, open the door for, for um, the changes to come mentally. And I said the coming of the Renaissance, I meant the coming of the Reformation. So the Reformation emerges at almost the exact same time. You see Luther is tapping on his 95 theses there in Saxony at roughly the same time as Francis is coming to the throne in France and eventually Charles coming to the emperor seat um, in Central Europe. So, so this upheaval impacted the Habsburg family as we saw. Okay, so all that's kind of context to kind of back us up. And here we can see a map of kind of how this all looks. This map's slightly misleading at this point because the purple reddish line should be all the way down here to the Papal States at this juncture going into the Thirty Years' War. We'll come back to this map later, but just so you can kind of see. And of course, what's happened, sorry, uh, what's happened as we've gone along is up here in the north, in the more northern lands and around the Baltic, you have a growth of the Lutheran um, ideas on the Rhine River, coming out of the Swiss Confederation of, of, of uh, cantons, as they called it, is the Reformed or Calvinist um, movement. And then, of course, over in England, you have the development of the Anglican faith. We, we covered all that ground. Well, all these ideas sound wonderful. And we would say maybe today, there, there actually probably are some new ideas now, some new churches, new religious concepts. And we would say, yeah, fine, you know, whatever somebody wants to do. But it, the history of the human is that um, the concept is re re connected to, um, is connected to the notion that 
the spiritual dimension of a people and the civic dimension of a people should be united. They, they should exist together. And as I tell the students, our idea of some separation between, as we like to say at church and state, would be considered odd to 90% of the humans who've ever lived on the planet. And the reason they would consider it odd actually has some merit. And it would be the idea that why would you not want your God or gods to contribute direction to the leaders of your, of your group? Why would you not want them um, involved in essence? And we have an answer for that, which we're not going to get into, but, but that'd be what they would say. So thus, when you look at what happens in Europe in this period of time, what's going on is that notion of the spiritual necessarily being connected to the, the, the social of the people. That, that if we're going to have a certain group of people living in a certain geographic space, and we want them to understand themselves as all belonging to this one space, to this one thing, then we would want to ensure that there's no questions about the religion. If you allow various religions in, the, the theory would have been, you are introducing kind of division within your people. So it shouldn't be surprising to us then that as Luther and Zwingli and Calvin are introducing these new ideas that the, pol that the political forces would both A, want to stop them if they feared for them, or B, see them as a way to gain more independence. And when you think, let's go back to this map for a second. When you think about, remember, within this purple uh, line here, you have roughly 300 independent entities. And again, the best way I describe it for people is think about the 70 or 80 counties in Florida. Imagine each one of those being an independent nation to itself. If you can think of that way, you understand what Central Europe, we actually understand what all of Europe was like in the time of the, of the Middle Ages. So within that, the Habsburg family had some strong control over this land, but not total control, and they certainly could not and were not trying to call it a nation to itself. So if you were the Duke of Saxony, or you were the Duke of Bavaria, or you were the elector of the Palatinate, you wanted to see yourself as independent. And the more independence you could gain from the emperor, the better. So this series of wars is a piece of this. In fact, I tell my students, I, I'm a little always uncomfortable with the term wars of religion, because it feeds into a misconception that many people have where they think, oh, those religious people, whatever, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, they're all just, you know, ready to kill people at the drop of the hat. And when, at least within Europe, I think this is fair, what you can say is instead that what you have is political leaders using religion as a mechanism to either gain control or a political leader fighting against a new religion in order to maintain control. And so you see that through this whole process. And we covered this ground, the early wars in Germany leading to the Peace of Augsburg, the struggle in both France and the Low Countries involving both the Bourbon family, the Valois family in France, and the Habsburg family, and the House of Orange in the Low Countries. And we kind of looked at how that all kind of led to, for Spain, this disaster of the Spanish Armada and so then what we found ourselves was at the early decade of the 1600s, there kind of being a pause, kind of the, the, the pause before the real clash would come because it wasn't settled. There had been some assassinations, there had been some deaths. At the same time, there had been a maintained sense of, of energy. Some of the key people like Henry IV and Elizabeth I who had been able to kind of get things to a calm status, had both died, or in Henry's case, had been assassinated. And so you just had this moment where you weren't sure where things were going to go. And remember, one of the problems with the Peace of Augsburgs was that it did not allow the Calvinist faith. So for all the places in Central Europe that had become Reformed or Calvinist, they were illegal. 
And remember also, as you can see there, the Calvinists, along with the Jesuits or the Counter-Reformation Catholics, were the most aggressive. They were the most um, militant. They were the most determined to kind of press their suit, press their ideas. And so for the Calvinists being left out, that was, that was another thing that kind of generated activity. So one of the things that I think is useful when we look at the Thirty Years' War as kind of talking about why do we study it and why is it the end of, of the course. So the course that I teach in Antiquities ends with this. And the Thirty Years' War is considered by most historians both the end of the medieval age and the beginning of modernity. And so when you're kind of studying, there's always that moment when you look at 1618 to 1648, and you say, this is the moment in which the Middle Ages closes down. And the war itself, I think, is useful. So this graph here, if you look really closely, it's kind of hard. It's not as good as I wanted it to be. You can see a little green marker up here and a little blue marker down here. And, and we're going to use this graph throughout the rest of the session. And this is my way of trying to point out something, which it'll make more sense if we go along. But when you look at this and you say the war starts, the Thirty Years' War, which arguably is the first world war, or at least a world war to itself, probably 80 to 85, maybe even 90% of the reason was religious. The whole focus was this continued tension about religion. And only maybe 10 to 20% of it was about politics. But that's going to shift as we go along. By the time we get to the end, it's going to flip-flop. And I'm going to show that to you. And you're going to see with the piece of Westphalia, um, this idea that um, – the individual nation begins to take precedence as opposed to family. So let's kind of dive a little further into it. So what happens? Um, well, the war is really a continuation of what we've already seen of this Habsburg Valois, now with Henry IV on the throne, to be better, of Habsburg Bourbon, Austria versus France story, where France feels surrounded. Remember the maps we've looked at where the Habsburg family had some influence literally surrounding France. But with the Spanish Armada, Spain is in decline and slipping. So it's kind of a last grasp of the Habsburgs trying to hold on to some authority, whereas France is in ascension. Um, they're going to have Henry IV, Louis XIII, with Cardinal Richelieu, who we'll meet in a minute, and Louis XIV, three dynamic leaders right in a row. While England is going to have two civil wars over the same time period. So she's not going to really be a participant yet. And meanwhile, there's that continued tension between the German princes, all the different leaders of those 300 states that I mentioned, versus the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor. So, so those things are going to kind of continue to cause us some tension as we go along. Now, Here's this map again, so you kind of can see all the different players who are involved. Down here is the city of Vienna, which you know, this has been the capital for the Habsburgs and the Holy Roman Empire for about 400 years. To their north is the city of Prague. You, of course, know this is the, the capital of the Czech Republic, but at this point, nobody's calling this land Czech anything. Everybody calls it Bohemia, so to the north. To the north of them is Saxony. And we remember Saxony because that's where Luther was. Over to the um, west from there, of course, is the Swiss Alps. And there's the Rhine River. North of the Rhine River is the Palatinate, which had by this point become one of the most important Calvinist states within the, uh, within the area. Up here in the top corner, of course, is what we know today as the Netherlands. But this was the Dutch Republic or the, the Low Countries. Today, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, but of course, back then, it was just a variety of independent places. I mean, Switzerland was 12 different cantons in each one of those places, Geneva, um, Basel, they, they were all independent from each other. So, there's our players on, on the table. The war is focused also on this continued tension of the Counter-Reformation, and one of the things that we'll want you to watch as we're going along is, is how the Habsburg family never picks up on this change of moving from family to nation. You may remember when we, when we introduced Henry IV to you at the end of the French Wars of Religion, we introduced to you the word politique, which of course you know that we get the word politics from, which related to our word politics. And the idea of a politique was a leader who 
no longer saw him or Elizabeth's case herself as doing what's best for my family, but a leader who began to say what's best for my people. Well, the Habsburgs never have that. We saw that last time with Philip II, and now we fast forward it past Philip's life into the early 1600s, and they still really do not understand that process. So you have this kind of movement, and we come back to Germany as the central focus, and the war will occur in Germany as we're going along. Here's a little closer map, which kind of gives you some of the players in the story. Um, the Palatinate, as you can see, has two parts. There's the Palatinate and there's the Upper Palatinate, which is just north of Bavaria. Over here is Württemberg, and up here is um, where the United Provinces are. There's Denmark, who we'll come back to. Holstein, which becomes really important for the German story. Way over here is Prussia. You may know that word. They're not really involved in the story at this point. Poland is actually one of the most powerful nations at this point. Here's a different map. It's the same piece. It just gives you the, the bottom half. And, of course, this is correct at the time of 1618 because, of course, it still has the Swiss Alps in the Holy Roman Empire. And, of course, the Papal States would have been, because of the Pope, very connected. So it's all kind of one big thing here. Okay, so let's dive in. When you study the Thirty Years' War, it's usually shown as happening over four phases. And these four phases are going to be where we're going to see this shifting movement from um, the medieval period to the modern period. The first phase is known as the Bohemian phase, and that's because it happens in Prague or in Bohemia, as, as we know it. Ferdinand II um, becomes the Holy Roman Emperor. He's, he's the leading Habsburg. After Philip of Spain passes, Ferdinand works with the Spanish Habsburgs to get their support. And so he becomes like the leading Habsburg, and the Spanish Habsburgs are willing to support him becoming the Holy Roman Emperor. He goes through the formalities of being, you know, chosen or recognized as the leader in Germanic Habsburg's land in Bohemia, in Hungary, uh, Hungary in Austria. This all happens in 1618. But, but Ferdinand is, is a counter-Reformation Catholic. And so, much like we saw Philip last time in Spain, Ferdinand works to impose Catholicism. Now, think back in your mind to what we learned with Mary, Mary I of England, and what we saw happen to Charles V of Germany in the exact same time. In both cases, after just a couple of decades, they tried to turn back the clock, and it was too late. People had spent 20 years worshiping a certain way, and even if they weren't um, deeply devoted to the theology of the Protestant Reformation, they had grown accustomed to their normal life without the Pope. So it didn't work. Well, Ferdinand's going to have the same experience, and he runs into the first problem with this in the city of Prague itself. He announces for all of his lands that there would be a revocation of the Peace of Augsburg and that everybody would have to go back to being Catholic. And when he did this for Bohemia, he sent some representatives and he sent them here to the castle of Prague, beautiful place. One day maybe you'll get to go. It's a lovely spot. And they had a meeting with the, the leaders or the kind of governing agency of the area called the Diet. And we've seen this before when we talked about Luther going to the Diet of Worms, where he really makes his famous stand. So the Diet is a gathering of the, of the political and nobility leaders. And of course, Bohemia has that in a smaller format for itself. So they met here um, and they went into this big hallway where they're kind of this picture over here. And they were having a conversation, they're making their big speech. And then a small group of the Bohemian leaders said, well, we want to take you over here and have a further conversation. They go down this little hallway right over here. And they took them into this room, and they promptly threw them out of that window right there. That is known as the defenestration of Prague. The defenestration means to throw out a window. So if you throw trash out your window, I hope you don't do that, then you, didn't, you, did, you could say, I didn't, de I didn't throw trash out. I defenestrated that plastic cup. So the deep industry, there's the window from the outside. 
Um, I took these pictures when I was there. So that's the same window. So they threw them down approximately two stories. So they were making their position known. We reject this revocation of the Peace of Augsburg. We, we refuse to accept um, that you can do this to us, and we instead are going to go our own way. And what they meant by go their own way was uh, they were going to, I'll come back to that in a second, they were going to turn to Frederick, and it's hard not to get Frederick and Ferdinand confused. Frederick, who is the elector or the leader of the Palatinate, to be their leader. They said, we want to choose that guy. And remember, the Palatinate was at this point becoming like the lead Germanic state for Calvinism. Well, you can imagine, of course, how the emperor takes this. I mean, not only was he mad about his people being attacked, he was infuriated that these Bohemians would think that they could just throw off their long-standing relationship and um, fealty to the empire. The interesting thing about the story is when they threw them out the window, um, the, uh, the Catholic, the emissaries from the emperor landed in a pile of, of manure. It was a big enough pile that it broke their fall. So they didn't die. And so you can imagine the PR of the time, both the Protestants and the Catholics took that story and ran with it. For the Protestants, it's of course that they landed in dung, and of course that's terrible, and you smelled, and your ideas are terrible. For the Catholics, it was that angels had protected them and had them land safely um, and not be killed, um, because obviously being thrown out a window, two stories, theoretically, the Bohemians were trying to kill them, but God had protected them. Well, the initial story, and again, here's this here's this graph. You can see a little bit better because it's bigger. You know, here's the the, the, the green and there's the blue. The, the initial story goes that um, it, it's, it's really one-sided because the emperor has the ability to call um, on the whole empire to help him fight this war. The Palatinate, Frederick, obviously initially turned to his other Protestant states to, to stand with him in the alliance and most of them refused. Um, it seemed pretty quickly that they were not interested. In fact, his best help, um, besides the Bohemian peoples themselves, came from the Ottomans. Um, and you can see then with the coming of the Ottomans and the Poles, you begin to see how this is going to become a broader, more international affair, uh, you know, as much of a world, world war as the war in 1914-19 was. Eventually, in, in 1620, the emperor will be successful in the Battle of White Mountain. Um, he uh, is aided deeply by the Duke of Bavaria, and the Duke of Bavaria's army is led by Baron von Tilly, and he is successful in winning this battle. Frederick has to kind of flee, run for his life. The Palatinate is invaded, and eventually most of the land is initially given to the Duke of Bavaria. The people there think, oh my gosh, we've lost. Well, this begins to worry the northern um, princes, and they begin looking for some solution. And here we can see for the first time how the emperor fails to see he'd be more successful trying to act like a politique and having a little, little, little uh, mercy, little grace. Okay, I won. I'm now I'm the king of Bohemia. We'll just back off everything else. But no, he presses on in. Um, he gives the Palatinate to Bavaria, as we said, so that's not going to get women, win him any friends there. The fact that he was willing to take the Duke's land from him directly worried the northern princes, and he begins to push even further for confiscation of other lands from nobles um, who had claimed to the Protestant position, even if they had not fought against him. So all of this then ultimately scares these leaders to look for a champion to fight for them. It also should be noted that at this point, this conflict is catching the eye of the French. And we'll come back to them in more in a moment, but you begin to have the French involved. But keep in mind, the French are Catholic. So one would imagine that they would take the side of the emperor in this religious war. For now, though, enter Denmark. So the leader of Denmark is conveniently named Christian, Christian IV. 
Denmark's up here in the northern part. I'm not sure where I'm at. There's a mouse. So of course, you know your geography. So Denmark's up here. And right here below it is uh, uh, Holstein. And in this land right here, the king of Denmark was also the, the noble leader. So he actually had a vote in the Holy Roman Empire, even though Denmark specifically was outside of the empire. So Christian brings his armies into the struggle and begins to fight. Now, he's fighting on two fronts, so it's not going to go well. I mentioned already the Bavarian general, Tilly. Well, because the Bavarian duke was really pressing, Ferdinand begins to get a little worried. He's not confident or comfortable with the amount of um, popularity that the Duke of Bavaria is gaining. And even though he agreed to give him that land of the Palatinate, now he's wondering if he's actually set up his own rival. So at this point, he turns to another Bohemian who was a Protestant, Albrecht of Wallenstein. So Albrecht, and you'll see his name sometimes if you search it on the internet, it sometimes is Albert, but in Anglicized. But it, Albrecht of, of Wallenstein is a fascinating figure. We could do a whole session just on him. But he's one of the key markers that we can say to ourselves, things are changing, aren't they? Let me show you this slide here. I'll come back, right? Now, all of a sudden, you can see as we enter phase two, look, it's actually more about politics and less about religion, right? We would imagine that the French, who were Catholic, would obviously be on the side of the, the Habsburgs if it's a religious war, but they're not. We would imagine that Albrecht, as a Protestant, would be on the side of the Protestants or fighting alongside Christian if it was a religious war, but he's not. He's an opportunist. He's looking for an opportunity. He promises to, to raise an army for the emperor. The emperor funds him. He begins asking the emperor, I want to make sure when I win, I get some land. And Christian's not able to defeat both Tilly and Wallenstein. And so he has to roll back to Denmark. And again, with phase twos, ending, it seemed that the war could come to an end. But yet again, what happens is Ferdinand overreaches. He signs the Peace of Lübeck with the Danes. He allows Christian to maintain control of Holstein, but largely pushes Denmark out of the story. He further controls what he's doing um, as far as within the Palatinate and Bohemia. And then he issues the Edict of Restitution. So in 1629, Ferdinand demonstrates that he clearly does not understand kind of how the politics of this is going to work. When he issues the Edict of Restitution, this is a demand that goes back over 100 years, that any lands that have been taken from the church during any part of the Reformation must be returned. Now, let me remind you what happened in England. Remember, after Henry, who was not really a Protestant at all, decided to make the move to enact what becomes known as Anglicanism, one of the key things that his lead advisors, Cromwell and Cramner, did was seize all the church lands in England so that Henry could give them away to his supporters. And, of course, the logic of this shows up with Mary, as we already said. When Mary, 20-something years later, attempts to turn back the clock, the thing in her face is not religious zeal, but the idea that these Englishmen who had gained all these lands wanted to keep the lands and the money and the wealth that they would have gotten from the land. And so the threat of Mary turned them against her. Well, now here, Ferdinand's going to have the exact same thing at a moment when he probably could have gained more control in the empire and had the opportunity to really begin to craft almost a, a beginnings of a Germany. Had he been willing to follow, say, the example of Henry IV instead of France, instead, he tries to squeeze the Protestants with this Edict of Restitution he goes after Calvinism in specific. 
Um, and in these two moves, he further inflames the religious zeal of the remaining Lutherans. His success and his boldness, though, also catches the attention of the French, who now realize that they are under threat. And this enters then one of my most favorite figures of history, Cardinal Richelieu. Now, we're going to back off to France just to get a running start here, just to make sure you remember. Henry IV took the throne at the end of the wars of religion within France and calmed everything down by, as a Protestant, announcing that he had become Catholic. So France remains a Catholic nation. But as he ruled until his assassination, he begins laying the foundation for France's road to absolutism. The simplest way to put it is that by the time we get to the end of this war, France will be on the cusp of developing the best example of an absolute monarch. And that's a different conversation. But the journey goes from Henry to his son, Louis, who becomes Louis XIII. When Louis XIII takes the throne after his father's assassination, he's a young child. His mother is Marie de' Medici. Now, you may remember, wait, I thought Henry was married to Marguerite of the Valois family. He was. That's what got him the throne. But they eventually separate. She goes into a nunnery and is out of the story. He wants to remarry to make sure he has a child. And he reaches for the very famous and important family who we've met before, Marie de' Medici. And so marrying the de' Medici family brings a whole new story and she was determined to make sure that there was a, a non-noble guidance. You remember part of what happened in the French wars of religion was that the different royal families were fighting over the throne. So Marie wants to protect her son, and she thinks, if I get somebody who can guide who's not of the nobility, that'd be better. Eventually, in 1624, Armand Jean de Plesse, or Cardinal Richelieu, he's the Duke of a place called Richelieu, and he just goes down in history as Cardinal Richelieu, becomes the lead voice. Richelieu is really an important figure. Now, if you know your Three Musketeers story, Richelieu is written as the bad guy. I always bristle at that because I don't, find, I don't think he actually is the bad guy in the story. In fact, because the story is always that Richelieu is trying to take over the throne or Richelieu wants to kill the king or something like that. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. He was very happy being the power behind the throne and deeply involved and determined to protect the monarchy. And he wants to protect Louis. And he'll be by Louis' side for over 20 years. He has a very Machiavellian viewpoint. We're going to do whatever we need to do to make sure we've got to pull this off. He wants to make sure that there's domestic tranquility. He is aware of what France has just gone through. He doesn't want there to be new riots or civil wars in France. And he's very aware of the threat of the Habsburgs having surrounded. He's glad, as where every French person was glad, for the Spanish Armada because that weakens them. But now, at this middle part of the war, he's watching the Austrian branch become resurgent. And so he can't do this. So he had urged the Danish king in. Now he's going to openly fund a new hero. And that brings us to Sweden. So the third phase is the Swedish phase. And again, now we can see with the entry of France openly funding this war, it's no longer a majority about religion. It's now about politics. Sweden does not get involved because they want to protect the Lutheran religion. Sweden gets involved because they want to make the Baltic a Swedish lake. They want to find a way to control things, and they're going to come very close to pulling it off. The whole northern Swedish, Poland, Russia struggle that will go for another 150 years or so is a fascinating study. If you're interested in Russian history, it's fascinating to look at what happens to Sweden in the story. This takes us to their king, Gustavus Adolphus. Now, the Swedes were the powerhouse. They were a strong, strong military force. They had some advancements in military, which I'll point out to you in a minute. Um, and so with French money, he will send his army into Germany. Let me show you a map here really quickly. So here they come swinging down here. They're going to land in, in Mecklenburg. 
and they're going to come flying down into here, and they're going to begin advancing this way. And for the next two years, they're going to be very successful in turning the tide back for Protestantism, which was a pretty big deal because, as we've seen so far, most of the battle has been all one-sided for the side of the, of the, of the emperor. But the coming of, of Adolphus will lead us in the correct direct, or it lead us back to a more balanced position in the struggle. And he will win at the Battle of Brightonfield a very significant victory. Some actually will say without the victory at the Battle of Brightonfield, there would not have been any way for the emperor, emperor to be defeated. He's successful there, eventually captures Munich, captures Prague takes most of Bavaria, takes back the Palatinate, frees it from the Bavarians. And so for about two years, he's in the ascension. Now, part of this was because, as I mentioned, the Swedish army was one of the most modern in Europe at the time. And it had a whole variety of different things, technological, as you can see there, as well as tactical, that he used to his advantage. But part also of what was going on was political intrigue. If we think that when we watch our current modern day Republicans and Democrats and the way that they've treated, you know, all the presidents always seem to struggle with whoever the other party is and we get frustrated with one party or the other, that's nothing new. That goes way, way back in, in history. And so it seems to be a kind of thing we do. And so within the empire, remember uh, Wallenstein, who I introduced you to Albrecht, he had become so popular with his victories in the Danish phase that he had begun seeing himself as an independent agent and had begun having conversations with a whole host of people. He'll actually reach out to um, the King uh, Gustavus um, to try to talk to the Swedes without permission of the emperor. Well, this will get him on the wrong side of some of the other powerful uh, leaders, including the Duke of Bavaria, and eventually, at least initially, well, eventually he's going to be assassinated. Uh, but initially he'll be fired, and then with the Swedish success, he'll be reinstated. But there's kind of this back and forth. And this is one of the things that opened the door for Adolphus to be successful as the Swedes march south. Now, eventually, it won't go well for the Swedes. They'll fight a very important battle in November of 32, the Battle of Lutzon. At the Battle of Lutzon, the Swedes win, but Adolphus is killed. This is against Wallenstein's army. So they lose, but the leader of the Swedes dies. So with the loss of their king and their military leader, the Swedes basically begin pulling back. They don't leave the area. They're going to participate in the next section. They begin pulling back. And eventually, through some other victories that the emperor is able to do through Wallenstein and others, He's able to get to a point in 1635 of announcing the Peace of Prague. Now, the Peace of Prague should have been the end of the war, should have been the end of the story. Um, Ferdinand finally, too late, but finally recognizes his error and goes moderate, basically reinstates the Augsburg decision. He still doesn't reach out to the Calvinists as he should have, um, no longer presses for return of all the lands, but it's too late. It's not too late for the Germans, though. It's too late for the French, because now Richelieu sees or believes that he sees he's got an opportunity to deal a crushing blow to the Habsburgs, and turns out he's right. And so now he's going to just bring the French forces and the French army in all directly. And so at this point, the war has ceased to have anything to do with religion and is strictly an international war that involves armies from all over the place. Norway has sent troops, England sent money, the Poles have sent troops, the Ottomans are still involved, Spain's still involved, the Russians are thinking about being involved. I mean, it is, it's an international war, but the focus has nothing to do with religion. And so you can see, again, when we talk about the Thirty Years' War, and we're talking about it being this moment that signifies the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of modernity, this is one of the main reasons here. That by the time you get to the beginning of Phase 4, it's 80 90% about politics and international state relations, and 10 
about religion. And you particularly see this amongst the German people themselves. If you think of the Thirty Years' War as starting in Germany or in the, among the German people themselves, by the end, the German people really are just trying to get out of the way. The war is really about non-Germans. And for the poor German people, it really becomes devastating. Phase four is a nightmare. Um, cities are destroyed. There's lots of mercenary armies. They're not well paid. So at points, they just kind of go off on their own. Um, the French forces, Swedish forces, um, you know, there are imperial forces involved, but it, it really just gets nasty. And before long, everybody wants to get out of the war, but as we've seen, and you probably know from your own study or your own life experience, it's easy to get into wars and it's really hard to get out, particularly wars that don't have a good point. And this one really did not have a good point. It didn't help things that Ferdinand himself dies, so then you kind of don't have the leader who led us into the war. They try to get things discussed starting in 40, 41, but things get muddled. Finally, in 43 and 42, Richelieu dies, and Louis XIII dies in 43 right after that. So that's actually helpful because then we finally can get to a point where you say, okay, look, we need to talk this thing out. Again, if you want to say it one way, particularly with the French phase, the losers are the German people. And you can see that with just the death totals. I mean, look, the red is showing it at 50%. Again, not trying to say anything about the current virus situation and that we've obviously lost a lot of people and it's obviously very sad, but percentage wise, I mean, we really haven't lost anything. And 50% of the people in Pomerania, 50% of the people in the Palatinate, you know, 40 to 50% in the upper Palatinate, 30 to 40% in Bavaria. I mean, the death total for the German peoples were terrible. Um, and many people tried to flee. From my family's story, our family history goes back to three brothers who decide they're getting out. They, we think they might have been from Saxony, maybe Westphalia, and they left. They fled from Germany in the 1640s to avoid this nightmare and came, came over to the New World. So you can see where the German people was a real destruction. Now, ultimately, they're going to meet these people in Westphalia, which is a, a small little little county, basically, as you can see there, sort of northwestern Central Europe, somewhat close to the Dutch Republic. They're going to meet in two cities. They're going to be in Munster, which we've met before. You may remember Munster was, was where the Anabaptists had taken over. After that disaster, Munster became a completely Catholic city. And Onsnabruck, and Onsnabruck was a, was a blended city. So it was more of a Protestant city. Protestant forces were in control. So it's interesting, this wasn't just like one meeting, like the, you may know the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, um, all the leaders, Woodrow Wilson and others, they, they go to Paris and they go to the, to the big palace of Versailles and they hung out for you know, nine months. Here, they're in two cities, it's complicated. They spent two or three or four months trying to figure out who was gonna sit where, they kept arguing with each other, but who was gonna get to sit in what part of the room. But the, the Peace of Westphalia is often held up as the first modern diplomatic moment. So diplomatic historians will talk about Westphalia as kind of a beginning of our expectations for diplomacy and modernity. I'm not saying it's the way it's got to be, but a couple of key things that they did were very important. One, they made sure everybody participated. So as you study peace treaties from Westphalia to now, one of the things that people will mark from a sense of that was a good one versus that was a bad one was, is everybody allowed to be involved? So after Napoleon, they go to Vienna and meet at what is called the Congress of Vienna. And we usually laud that moment as a positive because everybody was involved. When you look at Versailles, it's a terrible peace treaty for lots of reasons. And one of the reasons why is the key players were not able to be involved. Germany wasn't involved, Russia wasn't involved. So this is a disaster, which in 1919, they even made sure that if you were on, it didn't matter if you were winning and losing, you got to be involved. So there were 194 of the 300 and some odd, you know, states, nations were included there. And so they all got to participate and had the conversations. And this really begins to really deepen this sense of we're talking about nations, not families. So what they did was they concluded 
several different issues, and it all gets kind of loosely lumped under the piece of this failure. Remember from last time we talked two weeks ago, um, the, the, the Dutch struggle with Spain is known in the Netherlands as the 80-year War of Independence. So they began that struggle in 1560, and here it is 1640, and in 1648 they finally get a peace treaty that's signed by the Habsburgs, acknowledging that the Low Countries, and in particular the United Provinces, what we now will call the Netherlands, is independent not only from the Habsburgs, but from the empire. France and their allies will deal with the Austrians and the Habsburgs and sign their own treaty in October. They'll do that in Munster, the exact same time. Sweden will do theirs in uh, Osnabrück, and it all becomes this piece of Westphalia. So what did they conclude? It's, it's a very significant peace treaty that was concluded. Some of it's very specific, and then other parts of it are very broad and general for us. Um, one way to look at it is that the Habsburgs lose, and they lose big, and France wins, and they win big. So you can see that here on this slide. The Habsburgs, they even lost their ancestral lands. Their initial lands from the 121100s had been, as I told you, in central, right on the Rhine. They lose those lands. It all goes to France. Uh, Bohemia no longer remains all that important. It really loses its independence and just becomes part of the holdings of the Habsburgs. You kind of get this idea of the Habsburgs becoming a southern central Catholic power, somewhat independent or pushed out from the northern part. And if you know your geography, you think about where Austria lies today and where Germany lies today, you can see that coming. And there's a longer story to go there. And speaking of Germany, you have these other states that rise up. So Bavaria really becomes important, but most important is the emergence of a group called Prussia that's under the leadership of the Hohenzollern family. And the Hohenzollern family has kind of ridden in in this last part of the Thirty Years' War and will be a dominant player. So this is the moment when Prussia steps in. Now, an easy way to think of Prussia is they're like a German version of Sparta, if you know your ancients and you know who the Spartans were and their love of military. And it will be Prussia that ultimately becomes the, the nucleus of what Germany is. And here's a map that can kind of show you some of the pieces. So here's Bavaria, and they get this land of Upper Palatinate, become part of Bavaria. The Habsburgs hold on to this lower land of what we now know as Austria, and really Bohemia ceases to become independent. Meanwhile, up here, the Hohenzollern family begins to really pick up all this in pink, all the way across here, the Hohenzollerns pick up and of course, it puts them very close to what we know eventually will be Berlin, which at this point is not that important. The Swedes will get land here on the Baltic. That'll be very important for them. And the French will pick up all this land on the Rhine River. And if you know your future Napoleonic and World War battles over Alsace and Lorraine, this is that moment when Hitler tries to take back Alsace and Lorraine in, 19, in 1933-34. He's not starting a new fight. He's just continuing an old fight. What else happens? Well, France becomes the dominant player. And of course, England's in the wings. And what will happen in the latter 1600s and running through the 1700s and 1800s will be a continuation of a struggle between England and France. But France, for now, is going to put a toehold on the Rhine River. And her next king, Louis XIV, will be very successful in expanding France's borders uh, eastward from their point of view. Sweden does become a dominant player, um, but she's going to unfortunately find herself contending with a growing Russia, who didn't really play a role in this story. And then not only does the Netherlands leave the empire, so does Switzerland. And of course, obviously, for both the United Provinces and the Swiss Alps, they had been somewhat independent for almost 100 years by this point in fact. Now this puts it into the law. And so ultimately what we see then is the empire and the papacy losing out. Another way to think of kind of an what, how we look at this, from this moment, if we study, you know, modern European history, the Pope plays no significant role 
until John Paul II. And so, you know, you go from the 1600s and there's no Pope or no papal um, movement of significance. When I'm teaching the modern Western, uh, Western Civ class, we start here. And I tell them as a backstory about the Reformation. And many of them know, of course, something about the Reformation. And they obviously know that there is a thing called the Pope, a person called the Pope. But I'll tell them, we will not talk about religion at all of any significance throughout this course because of what happens here. With the, the ending of the Thirty Years' War, religion does become separated from politics, and specifically the papacy kind of recedes in importance. Another key outcome, as I've already mentioned, is unification in Central Europe is delayed. So we've seen from the 13 and 1400s in the West a movement to unification. You're going to see the emergence, we've already talked about it, of Spain, of Portugal, of France, of England. But in the central part, it's going to stay broken up. And that's part of what happens here. The Germanic princes, the Duke of Saxony, the Duke of Bavaria, the Duke of, of the Palatinate, uh, the Duke of Westphalia, these people are going to have their own sense of an independence that will lead them at different levels, of course, into thinking of themselves as a sovereign, independent state, not merely just part of the empire. And then, as I mentioned also, you'll begin to see kind of this vision of a northern Germanic lands that's Protestant, that initially is not led by anybody, but it's where Prussia happens to be. And then you have southern lands that remain under the dominion of the Habsburgs, in that kind of that swoop around from Bohemia down to what we would know as Austria, northern Italy. They're going to be very involved in those lands. And so now you're going to begin to see how we could easily end up with two nations, not one, in Central Europe. Let me show you a map, and then we'll kind of wrap it up here. So here's just kind of the map again. Let me go past this map and go. So here is where we started our, our you know, two months ago, looking at the time of the Renaissance. And again, every place you see a color, think of it like being an independent nation. So this is the, you know, kind of the, the ending of the medieval time period with all these different little groups. There's still the Byzantine Empire. This is before the conquest of Constantinople. Then you jump forward, and now the Ottomans have conquered Constantinople. They're in the Balkans. And you can see that there's, you know, less, particularly if you look over here, there's more unification. You kind of move forward a little bit more, and now all of a sudden we're into the 1600s. And then now when you get to the 1700s, you really begin seeing how there's this upper part here that's all united around Prussia. So you can kind of begin to see that there's this group that's this kind of swoopy part, including Bavaria, and then this green part that's all kind of where the Habsburgs are. And so you kind of can see kind of the future of where we're going. Again, the Thirty Years' War is best understood as the conclusion not only of the wars of religion, but a conclusion of the medieval period in total. And now, from this point forward, you're looking at a version of modernity. I tell my students, if I took you back in time and dropped you off in 1300 or 15, 1200 or, or 500, you wouldn't like it and you wouldn't recognize it. But if I took you back to 1700, you wouldn't fully like it because you wouldn't have air conditioning, but you'd recognize it, particularly if I took you to a city. You'd, you'd, you'd feel like I could probably navigate this because we've now come into modern. There's ideas that exist in this time period after the Thirty Years' War and after that conclusion of the Re Reformation that don't exist prior to this moment in the coming of the Renaissance and the Reformation. And that is our conclusion for, for the night. Um, I'll pause for a second. Nobody's put any questions in, which is totally great. But just see if anybody has a question you want to ask um, before we leave Europe. I think next week, actually, I, I haven't decided fully, but I think I'm thinking I'm going to take us to the U.S. Civil War, so 200 years after this moment. Um, but before we leave, I just wanted to see if there's anybody who had a question about Europe you wanted to ask or about the war specifically. Um, I don't think the Thirty Years' War gets enough focus 
Um, many Germans, uh, historians at least, would tell you it actually was more devastating to German people than either World War I or World War II. Any questions, anybody? It's okay if you don't. Well, it's wonderful to see each of you. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for catching on. And again, we will look to see you hopefully next week when we will come back to uh, focus on uh, some American history. I'm not sure how long we'll do that one, but we'll try to get us there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you spending time with me. Have Thank a great you, evening. Carl. You're welcome. Thank you, Thanks. Carl. That was really, really interesting. Good. Thanks, Thank Jocelyn. You. Loved it this evening. Thank you much. All right. Well, see, you, see you next week. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good week. <laughs>